All right. Well, we're going to be taking a little a tour of the solar system tonight. Let me, uh, I don't believe, I rarely see anyone breaking out their s cell phones and uh, taking down the lecture notes. But if you want to, that's what that's for up there. You can take down the lecture notes for that. And uh, there will be a quiz at the end. So the lecture notes help you pass the quizzes, you know, and uh, that's uh, it's always helpful. There's going to be a lot to cover on this. So like I say, there, there's, there's a quite, a, uh, quite a, a bit to cover here, and I'm still unsure about at this point of where I'm going to stop tonight. <laughs> but I'll get a, I, well, I have an idea where I'm going to stop. We'll see if I actually stop there. But we're going to take a little tour of the solar system, uh, specifically focusing on theories on, or on its origin by natural science. And, uh, and then the physical evidence that we have uncovered that argue against that substantially. So, you know, remember today natural science is trying to teach us a speculative history of the world as though it's an absolute fact. They have their theories about how these things formed and, uh, but we know how they really formed. Yeah, we know how they really formed. And uh, so, <clears throat> Let's just start, let's just start where, where, where probably where we should, should. The astronomical bodies in the solar system were f all formed on the fourth day of creation. You probably know this. Um, Genesis 1, 14 and 19 describes their various processes. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God said, let them be expanse, <coughs> let them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. You know, it is noteworthy that uh, for five days, God created the earth and its inhabitants and spent only one day creating all of the astronomical bodies. The cosmos, all of the astronomical bodies in the cosmos were created on one day and five days he spent creating the earth and, and its inhabitants. Spent two days on animals, spent twice as long on animals as he did on all the rest of the, all the astronomical bodies combined. So when you're talking about complexity and design, it's not out there in the cosmos that we look for that, it's here on Earth. When you look at the complexity and design of the cell or of biological organisms like animals, one of my favorite subjects, I mean, how can someone not see, you know, what is so obvious to others that this world was made? I mean, this place should not be here, you know? It really should not be here. Well, we're surrounded by the great enveloping cosmic dark, uh, black death it surrounds us everywhere we look for infinity out there. And yet here we find this special world that is just so bizarrely perfect and beautiful that it just shouldn't be here. And actually, you know, there's a, a real school of thought that proposes that we are just in a virtual, we are in a virtual reality. It is so beautiful and perfect that it really is unreal. And there's a school of thought that we are just in some kind of virtual reality. If you've ever seen the movie The Matrix, that's a, there's, that's a real school of thought. I mean, much, much, sometimes it's hard to tell whether science fiction gets its stuff from science or whether science gets its stuff from science fiction at this point. There's such a, a connect between the two, sometimes it's hard to say. And for young people that are, well, I'm a big sci-fi fan, for young people, I think they can get that old blurred. You know, where, where, you, where did you learn something, you know, sometimes? Well, it was in some sci-fi movie we saw once upon a time, and it's incorporated along with all the other stuff you, you've heard or seen to the point where you can't sometimes remember what you've learned. Well, humans have long studied, uh, struggled to explain the precision of the cosmos through uh, various cosmological models. Nikolai Copernicus, shown here, is responsible for our current model of the solar system and is considered uh, the founder of modern astronomy. He referred to the cosmos as built for us by the best and most orderly workmen of all. We see rather than chaos, randomness, and disorder, as one would expect in a universe birthed out of a great cosmic explosion like the Big Bang, we see instead clockwork precision that governs the cosmos at every level. The solar system consists of our sun, eight planets, you have uh, four terrestrial or rocky planets, and then four what are known as gas giants, plus you know your dwarf planets, asteroids, meteorites, and, uh, and comets. 
Astronomers have determined that, that the planets stabilize the distance of the Earth from the Sun and uh, keep the Earth from approaching too close or too far away. They also protect the Earth from comets, meteors, and asteroids. God created for us a remarkable solar system positioned around the sun that was perfectly formed and perfectly positioned to provide us with just, amount, just the right amount of heat and light. All the pictures that you're seeing here are from space telescopes and space crafts that have given us close-up views of these planets that were only seen before as pinpoints of light by past generations. We're really fortunate to live at, the, at a time when we had technologies have developed that allow us to see parts of God's creation no one else has seen before. Whether that's the things out far out there in the solar system or in the cosmos or the microscopic things that our microscopes have enabled us to see. We live uh, truly at a, a very, very fortunate time. No, uh, prior, uh, prior generations only saw the planets as pinpoints of light. The, the word planet actually comes from the word, it's from the Greek word wanderer. Because see, all the stars are fixed, but there were a few stars out there that moved, that wandered through the fixed stars of the cosmos, there were a few stars, or what they thought was stars out there, that were wanderers. We now know these are the planets in our solar system. While the solar system is <clears throat> masterfully engineered, secular scientists today claim that uh, it formed by pure natural processes. The leading theory to explain the origin of solar, the solar system is called the, the nebula theory. Ne nebula are cl gas, uh, clouds of gas and dust that are believed to be the remnants or the remains of stars that have undergone supernova or have exploded. Stars have exploded, leaving behind these clouds of gas and dust. And uh, m m today, the leading theory to explain the origin of the solar system, the origin of things like stars is that they originated from a nebula, one of these gas and dust clouds that are believed to be the remnants or remains of stars that have exploded. Well, many of these nebula are massive. Within, uh, for example, within the Orion constellation, we find uh, the Orion Nebula, shown here, which spans 13 light years in size. 13 light years. So to understand how big this is, a light year is the uh, distance that light will travel in a year, traveling at 186,000 miles per second. So traveling at 186,000 miles per second for an entire year, you have one light year. And uh, the Orion Nebula is seen here is 13 light years in size, a gas and dust cloud, 13 light years uh, in size. It would take you 13 years traveling at this 186,000 miles per second to get from one side of this nebula to the other side of the nebula. Well, secular science claims that the solar system, both the planets and, uh, and our sun, formed uh, about 4.6 billion years ago through, again, purely natural processes within one of these nebula. The theory asserts that uh, as the nebula rotated due to regional movements of the galaxy, you have these gas and dust clouds within the galaxy, and as the galaxy spins, it would cause more localized movement and, and uh, that this movement uh, caused these gas and dust clouds to collapse and become more condensed somehow, and, uh, and then it flattened into a disk, a central bulge formed in the middle and became our sun smaller collections of material in the gas and dust cloud became the planets. This is the leading theory. Now, well, there, are a number of, uh, of the <clears throat> there are a number of theories that have been put forth to explain uh, the, how this gas and dust cloud mysteriously collapsed or became more dense uh, to form and forming our solar system. Some say it collapsed under its own gravity literally. Others invoke uh, cooling to reverse the natural tendency of gases to expand, because the gases expand until they will fill their space, and if there's, uh, the hotter they are, the more quickly they will expand. <clears throat> and uh, more recently, collision has been invoked. Uh, collision mechanism has been invoked to, uh, to explain the, how this gas and dust cloud can, can became more dense, condensed to where uh, stuff like stars and things would form. Uh, and this is currently today the leading theory 
uh, the collision mechanism is getting currently the leading theory, the most dominant theory to explain this. Now, this is a, a long-standing theory going uh, back uh, to uh, the 1700s in uh, the, the nebula theory itself. In 1755, Immanuel Kant first argued that gaseous clouds nebula slowly rotate and gradually collapse and flatten due to gravity, eventually forming uh, stars and planets. In 1796, Pierre Simon uh, Laplace uh, put forward a theory arguing for a contracting and cooling proto-solar cloud as he, he called it to explain this. As it cooled and contra contracted, it flattened and spun more rapidly, throwing off or shedding a series of gaseous rings of material. And according to him, the planets uh, c condensed from this material. There's a, there are, however, a number of major problems with this theory. It violates some of the basic laws of physics, uh, most particularly that fact that gas and dust clouds expand through diffusion. They do not contract uh, unless somehow forced to do so. Uh, if I have a little cloud over here, it just will gradually uh, spread out, spread out further until it's evenly, those particles are evenly distributed in this space. That's what they do. As particles bang into one another, they spread further apart. This is what diffusion is, and gas and things diffuse until they're, they occupy their ent entire space. Well, astro the astronomer Fred Whipple stated in uh, The Mystery of Comets, this. He says, precisely how a section of interstellar cloud collapses gravitationally into a star is still a challenging theoretical problem. Astronomers have yet to find an interstellar cloud in the actual process of a collapse. Dr. Don DeYoung, who is a, a, a creation scientist, he has a PhD in physics from Iowa State and is a professor of the department uh, and uh, is a professor and department chair at Grace College and the president of the Creation Research Society says this. Now I uh, I pause it because I believe Don DeYoung is is speaking next Friday in, up in Everett. I can uh, double check on that if uh, that is something you're interested in, let me know. But I believe he is speaking at a, uh, the Atonement Free Lutheran Church next Friday in, in Everett, if I remember correctly. Anyway, he says this, the complete birth of a star has never been observed. The principles of physics demand some special conditions for star formation and also for a long time period. A cloud of hydrogen gas must be compressed to a sufficiently small size so that gravity dominates. And he continues. In space, however, almost every gas cloud is light years in size, hundreds of times greater than the critical size needed for a stable star. As a result, outward gas pressures cause these clouds to spread out further, not contract. Denny Faulkner holds a PhD in astronomy from Indiana University and taught at the University of South Carolina for uh, something like 26 years. He served as the editor for the Creation Research Society Quarterly, one of the uh, quarterly public creation science publications in this country, and has published over 100 papers in various science journals. He now works as the uh, researcher, author, and speaker for Answers in Genesis, which is one of the national, one of the main national uh, uh, creation science ministries in this country, and the one that built the great the ark and the creation museum over in Indiana, Answers in Genesis. Anyway, he said this: most astronomers believe that the clouds gradually contract under their own weight to form stars. This process has never been observed. But if it did occur, it would take many human lifetimes. He continues, it is known that clouds do not spontaneously collapse to form stars. The clouds possess considerable mass, but they are so large that their gravity is very feeble. Any decrease in size would be met by an increase in gas pressure that would cause a cloud to re-expand. And again, uh, Gas, uh, gases expand until they evenly fill their space. They do not magically compress. Well, the inability for gravitational contraction and, or cooling to account for this phenomena has led to another theory that I mentioned previously, and that is a theory of a collision. What they argue is that, uh, is that perhaps a supernova might have caused a, nev ne a nebula, a, re a, a nebula near the a supernova, to uh, be compressed sufficiently uh, 
to uh, where to the point where a star would form inside of this gas and dust cloud. An obvious problem with this mechanism for the Nebula theory uh, in general is that it requires what? What does this theory require? It requires stars. So the, their theory for the origin of stars requires stars to undergo a supernova to leave behind a gas and dust cloud and another star to undergo a supernova to compress a, another gas and dust cloud. <laughs> so how, where'd you get the, how do you get the first stars to form? You know, if, you, if your leading theory on star formation requires stars, more than one star, the one to uh, lead the supernova, a remnant of a supernova and the other to compress that remnant. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the other bodies in the solar system, the asteroids, planetesimals, and planets are believed to have formed by accretion. Uh, as the gas and dust cloud coalesced, larger grains of dust formed. These dust particles then stuck together to become rocks which became even bigger rocks through accretion, uh, which became asteroids and planetesimals, which then became planets. During accretion, small grains stick to one another uh, via electromagnetic forces, uh, kind of static electricity kind of mechanism, until they are massive enough to attract via gravity to form planetesimals. I mean, every, everything has gravity. The larger something is, the more gravity it's going to have. So if something gets bigger, its gravity comes larger, and it can pull more things to itself. This is the, the currently the leading theory. Well, the nebula theory is said to account for a number of the uh, features of our solar system. For example, the flat shape of the solar system. All the planets orbit around uh, the sun in a disk um, called the plane of the ecliptic except for Pluto, which is a little, uh, little uh, a bit of an oddball. The, uh, counter, they all, the counterclockwise orbit of the planets is said to uh, be supported by the nebular theory, the fact that they are. And the existence of the inner rocky planets, the, that fact that the planets on the inner portion of the solar system are rocky, and those that are on the outer portion are gaseous, is said to be supported by this. Being close to the sun made it possible for things like uh, water and volatile gases to condense, and so only rocky planets formed there. Further away from the sun being cooler, gases were able to condense forming a ga the ga what we call the gas giants, the bigger of the planets. However, the physics of it doesn't work. Uh, you can get up to uh, can get up to planetesimals, but not planets through such a mechanism. Uh, Martin Harwitz says in uh, the Astrophysical Concepts, once these planetesimals have been formed, further growth of planets may occur through their gravitational accretion in larger bodies, but just how that takes place is not understood. Furthermore, the uh, nebula theory and the uh, movement necessary to create the flattened disk were based on previous models of our solar system. However, we now know that the solar system is traveling around the galaxy at an average speed of about 500,000 miles per hour. You're, you, didn't, you didn't know you were traveling 500,000 miles per hour, do you? I mean, your hair's not even blowing. It's incredible. It's, it's in there. But it's true. The solar system and the galaxy is, is spinning. We call these the galaxies and moving. And based on the movement, the estimated movement of the galaxy, our solar system is traveling around the galaxy at something close to 500,000 miles per, uh, per, uh, per hour, 143 miles per second. So the model of the solar system is more accurately described now as what they call a helical model of the solar system, where the sun is traveling around the solar system at 500,000 miles per hour, dragging all the planets with it in tow. Now, think about the design behind all this. I mean, the, the way that this, all of this, all the spinning of our solar system is ultimately driven by larger scale movements of the galaxy, which may in fact be relying upon even larger scale movements within the universe. Now, understand how to wrap your mind around something like that. I mean, God made this as in control of this, but boy, that's a, mm. The design behind that, you know, to keep our solar system spinning, we have to be within a galaxy, and that galaxy has to be within a larger scale movement of the universe. I mean, well, what an amazing thing God made. 
Well, the question we need to ask is what does the evidence best support? Does it support the Nebuchadnezzar model or does it support a biblical model which says the solar system formed recently by an intelligent creator to provide a, an, a, 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 an habitable earth? Well, according to the nebula theory, every moon uh, or planet formed along similar lines and should be uh, not too different from each other and can form to a single pattern. The closer s things are to each other in the solar system, the more similar they should be in, uh, in, uh, in components, what they're made of and what what they're like, the closer things are in the solar system, one of the more similar they should be if they form through pretty natural processes alone. But we uh, find that this is uh, definitely not the case. <clears throat> this is not what we find. And we're going to uh, kind of reviewing this as we move through the various planets. We'll uh, take a look at the un your uniqueness that defies the naturalistic explanation of known as the nebula theory and more. <clears throat> So we're going to be looking at each what kind of each planet in turn. I'm not sure I cover every single planet, but most of them. And we're going to be looking at the design features and uniqueness that decries creation and defies na the natural theory that we call the nebula hypo theory or hypothesis. So first we'll start with the terrestrial planets. Seen here are Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. We'll start with Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. It's smaller than all other planets except uh, Pluto. Even a smaller than uh, G Ganymede and Titan, uh, the, to the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Temperatures on Mercury range wildly from 840 degrees to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Zero. Temperatures on uh, uh, Mercury, excuse me, looks much like our moon and uh, has lots of craters. If you didn't know this was Mercury, you would assume this is a picture of the moon. This is a picture of Mercury. Taken from, uh, this is taken from the Messenger spacecraft. Here's a colorized image of Mercury from a Mariner 10 spacecraft. This was taken uh, back in 1974 and 1975. Well, in addition to pictures, Mercury, uh, Mariner 10 took uh, measurements of Mercury's gravity and other properties, and they found a big surprise. It was discovered to have the highest known density of all planets, other than uh, Earth, that is. Problem is, Mercury is too small to have such a high density. Its small size means it doesn't have a strong gravitational field and should not have compacted all that material to such a high density. Without a strong gravitational field, how do you get such a dense planet? In fact, up to 75% of the radius of Mercury is thought to be represented by an iron core. 75% is a massive iron core, shown in this cutout view uh, from uh, NASA to talk about uh, talking about Mercury. So what's the solution to this? A solution as described by Taylor here in, uh, in uh, the, the solar system evolution, a new perspective, he says, the driving force behind uh, previous attempts to account for Mercury has been to fit the high density of the planet into some uh, preferred overall solar system scheme. It has become clear that none of these proposed models work and the high density is conveniently accommodated by what they call the large impact hypothesis, which makes Mercury unique. Thus, the hypothetical solution for Mercury's unusual density is known as the large impact hypothesis. It is believed that early in its history, an asteroid must have crashed into Mercury the lighter material must have been stripped away by this impact, leaving behind the dense planet we see today. This is a, an artist's conception that shows a, a celestial body about the size of our moon sl slamming at great speed into Mercury. This is a leading hypothesis to explain the origin of Mercury. Well, colli cosmic collisions are invoked to explain most of the unusual features of our solar system, so many in fact that we might consider them to have superpowers. We're going to be looking at some of these super asteroids as we go through this. Mm -hmm. Well, Mariner 10, back in, again, back in 1974, 1975, also discovered that Mercury has a magnetic field. 
which has a uh, which was a huge mystery for decades. It, if it's billions of years old, it can't have a magnetic field unless the, the core is molten as a way of rejuvenating that ma magnetic field. But it's too small and too old to have a, a molten core. So this mystery remained for three decades until it was discovered in 2007 that Mercury has a molten core. Researchers working with high-precision planetary radars, including the Goldstone Solar System Radar of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, have discovered strong evidence that the planet Mercury has a molten core. The finding explains a more than three-decade-old planetary mystery that began with the flight of a Mariner 10 spacecraft. Scientists had not expected to find a magnetic field at, uh, at Mercury, said Professor Julian. Of <clears throat> magnetic fields are associated with molten cores, and the prevailing theory was that the planet was too small to have a molten core. He continues, scientists theorized that Mercury consisted of a silicate mantle surrounding a solid iron core. This iron core was considered solid, or so that there went, because small planets like Mercury cool off rapidly after their formation. If Mercury followed this pattern, then its core should have frozen long ago. If it's truly that old, it should have frozen long ago. So, <clears throat> Mercury defies explanation. If the nebula theory is true, it can't be dense, but it is. It can't have a magnetic field, but it does. And it can't have a molten core, but it does. So. We are told by Paul in 1 Corinthians that God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Well, let's look into Venus. No, Venus should be very similar to the Earth because it's very close to the Earth. The closer things are in the solar system one another, the more similar they should be. And, uh, both planets supposedly formed at the same time, at roughly the same place, from the same general materials, by the same natural processes, and thus should be very similar in size, mass, and composition. Is it? Well, Venus was recorded by the Jupiter-bound Galileo spacecraft shortly after its uh, gravity-assisted flyby of Venus, in, uh, and this is in February 1990. Galileo Galileo's glimpse of the veiled planet shows it swirling with sulfuric acid clouds. The atmosphere is a primarily carbon dioxide with clouds of concentrated sulfuric acid. A massive greenhouse effect on Venus causes it to be the hottest place in the solar system, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. It also has a a massive atmospheric pressure of 90 atmospheres. Here we are at one atmosphere, just so you know. So this is 90 times our atmospheric pressure, and it has no magnetic field. Well, a big mystery in explaining the origin of Venus is that it rotates uh, retrograde uh, clockwise with respect to its orbit. Other planets rotate counterclockwise. So the explanation for the backward rotation uh, was, uh, inc has included a, a gravitational braking uh, on, a on a tidal bulge, but uh, Venus doesn't have a tidal bulge. It's al almost perfectly round. Today's explanation uh, for Venus, uh, how Venus form, <clears throat> mm, yeah. mm -hmm. Venus formed as predicted by the nebular accretion, but then an asteroid hit it and spun it around the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no evidence for this collision. Uh, Venus's axial tilt is about two degrees from perfectly perpendicular to the ecliptic plane. Its uh, orbit is the most circular in the solar system. The only evidence that uh, is that otherwise Venus would contradict the nebula theory. So it had to get hit by an asteroid or something. What we're not being told about Venus is that it should be similar to the Earth, but it has no magnetic field, and its crust uh, structure is very different. Its surface is obviously young. It rotates the wrong way. Lots of mysteries about Venus.
the Earth, we want to spend some time talking about the Earth and the moon system. Um, but let me, let me just go and touch on there just a bit, and then we'll come back to this next, uh, next time around. <clears throat> Our Earth is a very, very special place. I don't need to really reiterate this point much. It spins at just the right speed. A 24-hour period gives us darkness for a period of time, which is good for things to have rest. But if it were, if it were closer, um, if it were slower, excuse me, like 10, 10 days, for example, we would have long, dark periods, long, cold periods. If it were faster, it would cause violent winds. It really does spin at just the right speed. Its actual tilt gives us uh, moderate seasons. Its circular orbit gives us climate stability. Its perfect distance from, it's at the perfect distance from the sun to have uh, the perfect temperature. Perfect temperature allowing liquid water which is uh, necessary for life. All of these factors and many more are, are necessary for Earth's habitability because as God said through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he informed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Well, we want to spend some time, more time talking about the Earth and, uh, and, how, um, and the perfection of it, but as well the origin of the moon. The origin of the moon still is a great mystery. So we want to review this and we will go on through the various planets, but I think this is a, a good place to pause for that. We will come back next month, starting with the Earth, moon system, and then keep walking through the solar system to see what, what the design features and the uniqueness that's there that decries naturalistic explanation. Let me close out in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord. Father, we, uh, we stand in awe of your works. Mm. And Father God, we ask for wisdom. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us wisdom, Father. We, uh, Father, we want to be a, a witness for you, a witness for Jesus Christ, Father. And we, we know that, you're, that, that the true history of this world is, uh, is, is not understood by many. That uh, science has, is, is teaching people a terrible lie. That this world formed all, all by itself and that at worst that we're nothing but a bunch of involved apes, Lord. Father God, and to be an effective witness for you, to be able to witness for you, Father God, we need uh, wisdom to help us understand the science, to understand the claims of science. And, and Father God, we'd ask that, uh, that when testifying, Father God, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and speak through us. Help us, Lord, give us strength and give us uh, boldness, Father, to, to, effective, to witness for you, Father God. Help us not to shrink back from the science, the claims of naturalism. Father God, help us to be bold in our testimony, Father, for we know that we are in possession of a great truth, that we possess a great truth, and the world is lost. Lord, help us to be bold and then speak to those that are around us, Father God, to speak to our friends, our peers, our coworkers about the truth that we know. Father God, help us. And when we counter people in the world, people in the supermarket, walking down the sidewalk, Father God, that we will engage in those conversations, that we will speak the name of God, that we will speak the name of Jesus and get those conversations started that will open people's eyes up to the reality of what this world is, to the reality of who they are. Father God, help us, Lord, because we know the world is lost. And the people that we see around us are lost. They have no clue who they are. They have no clue where they are. They've been convinced by false teachings and lies, Lord God. And help us to be bold, Father, in our witness. Help us to be bold when we see people, the people around us who we know are lost, so lost. Father God, help us, Father. Give us wisdom. And give us boldness to speak and teach the name, teach about the truths of creation that we know and to speak the name of Jesus. We praise you, Father. We praise you. We praise your holy name, Father God. We thank you for this wonderful world. 
that we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die and pay the penalties for our sins, wretched sinners as we are. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins as we forgive others, we ask. Forgive us and help us to walk the path of righteousness so that our life may glorify and honor you, Lord God. Praise you, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.